Thank you for taking the time to watch this video. I am Jennifer Fang, neonatologist at Mayo Clinic. I serve as the medical director for our teleneonatology program and will be serving as one of the co-principal investigators for the teleneo trial. So our team wanted to take about 15 minutes or so just to share with you a little bit more about the trial, what we've achieved so far, and where we'll be going in the near future. So this is the agenda for the next 15 minutes. Um, I'll talk a little bit about who all is participating in the trial and the structure of the investigative team. And then I'll share with you really what the purpose of the trial is. Why are we even considering conducting this large multi-center trial? And then I'll review our achievements thus far and then what's next. So to start, um, I wanted to share with you the members of the Teleneo trial team. So Mayo Clinic for this trial will serve as the sponsor site. So I will serve as co-principal investigator with my colleague, Dr. Bart DeMarshall. Dr. DeMarshall is a professor of neurology at Mayo Clinic in Arizona, and he has extensive experience with telestroke and with conducting multi-center clinical trials studying telestroke. Fantastic guy. Um, we also have identified four wonderful organizations that are going to participate in this trial. So we have the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto, and the site investigator for sick kids is Dr. Hillary White. The University of Washington and Seattle Children's will also be participating, led by Dr. Rachel Umarin and assisted by Dr. Mark Lowe. University of Wisconsin-Madison is our third site, and the site investigator for what Madison is Dr. Jamie Lynn Joko. And then we also have Oklahoma University, whose site PI is Dr. Abhi Makar. So again, really strong investigative team that will be conducting this trial. I wanted to share this with you, which really summarizes the structure of kind of the team and all of the different groups that will be involved. So again, as I mentioned, Mayo Clinic will serve as the sponsor site. We are responsible for all of the clinical trial coordination, communication, and we're responsible for successfully initiating and executing the trial. If we secure funding from NIH, then we will work with their staff as well as we move through the trial. We've identified an independent data safety monitoring board that will be monitoring the progress of the trial, particularly with respect to safety. Any NIH funded trial requires a single or central IRB of record. So for all of the sites in the United States, Mayo Clinic will serve as that IRB. And as we move forward, this will require some partnership and paperwork uh, with all of you such that your community hospital can rely upon the Mayo Clinic IRB. Now, for our friends in Canada, um, the Hospital for Sick Kids will be partnering with Clinical Trials of Ontario to serve as a central IRB for the Canadian sites. There will be a teleneo trial steering committee that will include all of the investigators and the study coordinators. And then we have identified a telemedicine vendor for the trial, which will be Teladoc, and they'll provide our telemedicine technology, uh, technical training, as well as support. And as I mentioned, you can see the four organizations that will serve as the subsites, and these will be the sites that will be enrolling all of our study participants. Each subsite has identified four to 10 community hospitals that will be within their network and participate in the trial. So you should see your community hospital listed there. So a little bit of background on why are we looking to study telemedicine for neonatal resuscitation? And this really, um, goes back to what's been published in the literature about differences in outcomes for high-risk neonates who are born in hospitals without a tertiary NICU. So there's been studies done in the US, Canada, Europe, Australia, New Zealand that show when at-risk neonates, so especially those born very preterm or for example, term patients with encephalopathy, when these neonates are born in a hospital without a NICU, they're at increased risk of mortality compared to similar patients born in a hospital with a tertiary NICU. 
In addition, we know these patients are more likely to receive CPR in the delivery room and experience serious morbidities that include pneumothorax, severe IVH, and seizure. So knowing that there's this difference in outcomes, I think we really have an opportunity to use telemedicine to address this outcome disparity. And through telemedicine, we can secure a real-time audio-video connection between the neonatologist in the NICU and the care team in the community hospital that's resuscitating this at-risk neonate. And so with telemedicine, this allows the neonatologist to visualize the newborn, which obviously they can't do on the phone, and really partner more closely with the care team in the community hospital, you know, provide that step-by-step -step guidance during these resuscitations. You know, when they're high acuity, complex, they can really coach the team through those steps that need to happen, you know, pretty quickly and optimally for the patient. And here at Mayo Clinic, we've done some initial studies that suggest that teleneonatology does improve the quality of these resuscitations. But we need to study this more rigorously and across multiple health systems so we can really learn, does this have a positive impact and improve the care of these patients? So the multi-center clinical trial that we're proposing has three specific aims. Um, the first and the primary aim is to determine whether teleneonatology has an impact on early neonatal mortality or the risk of death before age seven in this higher risk population. We have two secondary aims as well. The first is to really study the impact of teleneonatology on the need for CPR in the delivery room, and then also evaluate the impact of teleneonatology on early morbidity, and specifically three outcomes, pneumothorax, severe intraventricular hemorrhage, and seizure in the first seven days of life. So in partnering with our statistician, we've powered this study to determine if there's differences in that primary aim, that difference in early neonatal mortality. And in order to detect a difference, we anticipate we will need to enroll 875 study eligible neonates across the 27 community hospitals over the five-year trial. So if we talk a little bit more about study design, again, this is a prospective multi-center research trial, and it's designed according to a methodology that's called a stepped wedge cluster randomized design, so that the trial itself is organized into five different steps. The first step is baseline. This is when all the community hospitals will just be providing their usual care and will collect data on study eligible patients. Then in the subsequent four steps, 25% of the sites will be randomized to start using teleneonatology for their study eligible neonates. So that by the time we get to step five, 100% of the sites are receiving tele the telemedicine intervention. So that's an overall kind of high level look at the trial. And Next, I wanted to discuss or share with all of you what have we achieved uh, thus far. So we've really accomplished quite a lot. Um, our investigative team has worked hard to develop and design a very rigorous multi-center trial that's going to take place in the US and Canada. And I'm very proud of the team that we've been able to bring together. I mean, these are great neonatologists, amazing investigators who are very passionate and committed to this study. And we're also very grateful that all of you in these community hospitals have been open to participating in this trial as well. So we've been able to work with you over the last few months to do a couple of studies looking at, you know, as a community hospital, are you ready for teleneonatology? Do you perceive this as a good fit for your practice? Uh, we also reached out to you to work through a study looking at 
How are you able to identify study eligible patients? How accurate are your assessments? Are you able to abstract and submit data? This is a lot of the pre-trial work that we needed to do to identify if there were any gaps that we needed to address so that when we move on into the, the full actual clinical trial, we're really positioned to be successful. And then we've submitted our grant application to the NIH. So I guess at this point, I just want to pause and again, thank all of you for your engagement and your participation. I realize you've been volunteering your time and your effort to do this at this point. So again, we're very grateful. So then I wanted to be able to also share with you the results of the surveys and the studies that we've done. So the first was the survey that we sent to all of you, really looking at your perceptions of teleneonatology. This was the survey where you read a little bit about teleneonatology, you watched a video of a simulated consult and a short video uh, of a patient's story, and then you were presented with 12 statements that you needed to agree or disagree with. And over 200 of you responded, which was a response rate of 56%, which is really very good for a survey response rate. And we had at least one person from every NICU and every community hospital respond. And overall, what we found is that staff in our NICUs and our community hospitals really perceive teleneonatology to be acceptable, appropriate, and feasible for their practices, which was great. This is what we were hoping to see, but we knew that if we didn't, if there were areas of concern, again, these were things we were going to need to kind of dig a little deeper to understand where there might be hesitation, because it's really important to have this foundation so that implementation and adoption of the study intervention would be successful. So if we look at the actual data, this table there on the left, you'll see those 12 statements, which might look familiar. Again, this was gauging your perception of the acceptability, the appropriateness and feasibility of teleneonatology. And if you look at the percent of respondents that agree to these statements, very high, anywhere from 89% up to 99%. So a very high level of, agree of agreement. In addition, you can see the mean score which were on a scale of one to five, again, very high, you know, 4.4 up to 4.7. So we took this to be very encouraging. Now, the second study was a little more focused. In this survey, we just asked one staff person uh, from each community hospital to complete this survey, which was really more focused on identifying how accurate um, community hospital staff could be with identifying study eligible patients and then uh, submitting study data to us. And so for this survey, the respondent reviewed the eligibility criteria for the study. So this included the inclusion criteria and the exclusion criteria. And then after sharing that information with the respondent, they, they were presented with five written neonatal resuscitation scenarios. And based on the description of that resuscitation, they had to decide if that neonate would or would not be eligible for the study. And if you look at the accuracy of determining study eligibility, again, very high, 89% accurate. This compares very favorably to data that we've seen published in the literature. Um, I think it's important to point out that people did this just by reading a description. There was no opportunity for discussion or for asking questions. And those things will be in place when we move forward with trial initiation. The investigator, the study coordinator will review all these criteria with you. You'll have an opportunity to ask questions and then we'll have little tables and flow charts you can use you know, as you're determining study eligibility. And we also learned what we need to do better for you, what things were unclear, so that with for the actual trial, we can ensure um, that there's improved clarity of the eligibility criteria. As part of this, again, we also asked for one of the scenarios that the respondent abstract and submit data 
to us. And this is because in the actual clinical trial, there may be some study eligible patients that don't end up in the NICU that remain with you in your community hospital. And so for some of those patients, we'll need you to send data to the study coordinator, and then together you'll review that. And so we wanted to see, again, how accurate um, were community hospital staff in sending us these data. And you can see accuracy, again, very high, 93%. Some data elements, 100% accurate. Again, this compares very favorably to what's been published in the literature. And again, you were doing this independently. You know, when we're actually in the clinical trial, the study coordinator will verify some of these with you using your like EMR or source documents. If you have questions, um, you can ask the study coordinator. So there'll be a lot more opportunities for feedback um, to enhance the accuracy even further. In addition, again, this helped us to identify what do we need to do better with the data collection tools to make it easier for you to submit the correct data. So with that, um, let's think about what's next. Where do we go from here? And I know many people are probably wondering, is this trial really happening? Like what's going on here? So we're very optimistic um, that we're gonna be able to move forward. But the fact is we need to secure funding for this trial. And securing funding for a trial of this size is a very lengthy and competitive process. So where we're at with that is that we submitted our grant grant to the NIH in October. And this grant submission will be reviewed by the NIH study section on either March 11th or 12th. And then we'll learn how our grant application scored by March 15th. Now this score, it ranges from 10 to 90, where actually 10 is the best. Typically, applications need to score somewhere between 10 and 20 to secure funding. So on March 17th, we'll get a sense if we're competitive or in the running to secure funding. And then what will happen is all of the grants that score well um, will then be reviewed to determine which grants achieve what's called notice of award or funding. And we should know that um, if we get that far, we'll know that in May. Now, if all of this falls into place and we can secure funding with this round and this application, then the earliest trial start date will be July of this year. So just to prepare you, we'll keep you up to date. You know, how did we score? Did we achieve notice of award? If we do, things may accelerate um, quite significantly in May and June as we get prepared to initiate the trial in July. So you'll start getting more frequent communications uh, from the research team. And the last thing I just want to touch based on is, you know, these trial preparations, we've been trying to maintain a balance between working with all of you enough that we're well prepared um, and strongly positioned for securing funding and completing the trial, but not hopefully asking so much of you that it's a, you know, unnecessary burden or effort, knowing we don't have any financial support yet. So hopefully um, that we've struck a reasonable balance from your perspective. Um, with that in mind, there may be a few items or questions that your investigators will ask of you. One may relate to credentialing. As we think about moving forward with telemedicine, it's helpful for us to know if your hospital will require neonatologists to have full credentialing at your site or if your bylaws allow for credentialing by proxy, which is increasingly um, more common and is sanctioned by, in the US, um, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. So there may be little items like that that we'll need to follow up with you on. So with that, I hope this 15 minutes or so was helpful in reviewing, you know, why we're doing the trial, where we're at with moving forward um, and really communicating with all of you and showing you um, our appreciation for everything you've done thus far. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. I've included my email here, um, or you can reach out to your investigator as well. And so with that, I uh, hope you're all doing well and staying healthy. Thank you.